Hi, my name is Kimberly Pack, and I would like to thank you all for coming to this week's PRC Friday seminar, which is, as Michael just said, in collaboration with the Center on Aging and Population Sciences. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Taylor Hargrove. Dr. Hargrove is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a faculty fellow at the Carolina Population Center, also at UNC. Dr. Hargrove's uh, research focuses on developments in health disparities, focusing on disparities with intersections of race, skin color, gender, and socioeconomic status, and she has written extensively on these topics. Her talk today is entitled The Examining the Mental Health Consequences of Race, Skin Color, and School Context. Before I pass the virtual mic over to Dr. Hargrove, just to remind everyone that Dr. Hargrove will talk for about 35 to 40 minutes, which will immediately be followed by a question and answer portion and will end promptly at 1 p.m. We ask that the first two questions of the Q&A portion be reserved for graduate students, which anyone may jump in after they ask these questions. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hargrove. Thank you, Kimberly and Michael. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Let me make sure I can get my slides up. Can everyone see the slides? Okay, great. Um, well, I'm really excited to be here um, and I'm really excited to share with you some results from a new project that I've been working on, which focuses on the linkages among race, skin color, racial contexts and health. And so I'm gonna be presenting one set of results from the overall project. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion at the end, um, any potential feedback or advice you might have for moving forward. So just to give you an idea of the overall purpose of the project, uh, the first aim is to investigate how several dimensions of race shape health and the nature of health inequality between black and white Americans across adulthood. And the second aim is to explore the extent to which relationships among these dimensions of race um, and health vary depending on the broader social context. Um, and the broader social context for today's talk being the school and the health outcome being depressive symptoms. So just to provide a little bit of motivation for the project and this set of results in particular, um, it's really important to investigate trends in depressive symptoms and mental health more broadly, right? And so one reason is its potential implications for mortality, right? So if we buy into this argument that midlife mortality rates might be rising due to what are called deaths of despair, right? These deaths from suicide, alcohol use, drug poisonings. We know that all racial groups, right? At least among a recent cohort of young adults are experiencing rises in despair, right? As captured by different mental health and substance use indicators. Other reasons include uh, the economic burden that's associated with depression and depressive symptoms, right? So that we know uh, the US economy spent uh, about $210 billion on depression related costs in 2010. And there are significant social and personal burdens that are attributed to, to depressive symptoms, such as poor physical health and other mental health outcomes, diminished socioeconomic achievement, and reduced quality of social and familial relationships, right? All of which can affect one's overall quality of life. And so we know that the burden of mental health is not experienced equally, right? So more specifically, recent studies have found that Black Americans tend to experience more depressive symptoms than their white counterparts. And these, should, these inequalities are projected to only get worse given the events over the past year and a half, right? So the pandemic, the various social movements for racial justice. And just as a quick example, uh, these are recent data from weekly surveys of US households that were collected by uh, the Census Bureau. And what these data are showing is that Black Americans experienced the highest increase in anxiety and depressive symptoms since 2019 compared to all other race ethnic groups. And part of this increase was due to the multiple instances of police brutality that went viral over the past few years. So for example, these same data show that the spike in anxiety and depressive symptoms among black Americans followed the spread of the video of George Floyd's killing. Right? So depressive symptoms, especially across the life course are something we need to keep track of and really interrogate. And so what's missing um, in this study of racial disparities and mental health? Well, first has been uh, less attention given to the role of early life contexts in shaping these trends. And so prior work, um, including uh, from scholars in this very room or this very uh, virtual meeting, 
has provided considerable evidence for the long arm of childhood, right? Or this ability of early life conditions to shape uh, developmental trajectories and patterns of advantage or disadvantage, even after controlling for adult contexts and experiences. And we know that schools are a really important uh, early life context that can shape trajectories of disadvantage or inequality. Specifically, schools can contribute to the reproduction of racial inequalities as they constitute racialized organizations, right? Or organizations whose rules and whose distributions of social material resources are influenced by different racial schemas or ideologies of subordination or superiority. So for example, we can think about uh, these debates over critical race theory or what people think or assume critical race theory is, right? And whether it should be in schools. So how this kind of works to establish curriculums that could ignore uh, or perhaps misapply the history of uh, or experiences of minoritized groups. We also know that certain forms of capital, right? Particularly cultural capital help students succeed in schools. We know that schools also enforce policies that separate racial groups from one another. So a big example of this being um, tracking, academic tracking, which can further segregate schools within, excuse me, segregate students within schools and provide different types of educational experiences, right? So there's been a, a lot of recent pushback um, to address these inequalities and in tracking within different school districts. And then lastly, uh, schools can expose students to varying degrees of discrimination, right? Whether that discrimination be from other students, from teachers, from the administration itself, all of which work to influence the educational experience and the potential uh, consequences of educational attainment. And so I argue that one way to try to capture these dynamics is by looking at patterns of mental health among students in schools that have varying uh, racial compositions. Right, so thinking about the types of schools that might heighten exposure to discrimination for minority students or might facilitate the development of psychosocial resources to cope with hardships across the life course. And there have been several studies that have linked the racial composition of schools to health and adulthood, um, but few have examined associations with trajectories of health across adulthood. But of course, one important exception is a study conducted by Katrina Walsman, Bethany Bell, and Bridget Goosby in 2011. And using four waves of data from Ad Health, they examined the relationship between the percentage of white students at a given school and trajectories of depressive symptoms across adolescents and young adulthood. And what they found was that as the percentage of white students increased, black students reported more depressive symptoms. And their findings also indicated that the effect of racial composition didn't vary um, by age. Right, so that, that would suggest that black and white students experience similar rates of change in depressive symptoms across young adult, adulthood, though black students began um, with higher levels of depressive symptoms. And so I see myself extending these findings in two major ways. The first is thinking about how multiple dimensions of race might differentiate some of these relationships. Right, so we know that race is a multidimensional concept that's comprised of several different indicators, thinking about racial identity, self-classification, observed race, phenotype, right? But a majority of health disparities research employs a self-identification self variable. So asking the respondent how they identify within a, a, a set of predefined categories. And while this certainly provides valuable information, these measures of race only capture one aspect of the stratification process, right? And so there are other dimensions of race that often go overlooked. And one such dimension is skin color. Right? So there's a long tradition of research that have found, that's found that the hue of one's skin significantly structures access to opportunities and desired resources, particularly among racial ethnic minority groups. And this unequal distribution of resources based on skin color is generally referred to as colorism. Right? So this ideological and structural system of inequality that privileges lighter skin. And these advantages translate into observed skin color stratification across a variety of life chances, particularly for Black Americans. And just to give a few brief examples, we see differences in the degree of income inequality by skin color, where um, for data from this study showed that lighter skinned Black Americans make about 8% less than uh, white Americans in terms of hourly wages, 
while their darker skin counterparts made about 17% less. We also see this in school suspension, uh, where those of darker skin are more likely to be suspended from school than their lighter skin counterparts. And we also see this within the criminal justice system. Right? So here we're looking at disparities in prison sentences among black and white adults who were convicted for the same crime. And what we're seeing here is that medium and dark skinned black Americans receive longer sentences than their lighter skinned and white counterparts. And the difference uh, culminated into about a, a year. So medium and darker skinned uh, black Americans were serving on average one year longer sentences for the same crime. And so these inequalities in life chances culminate into inequalities in health, right? With various studies documenting health disadvantages of darker skinned black adults relative to their lighter skinned or white counterparts. But we know less about whether skin tone disparities vary across adulthood, right? Particularly when it comes to mental health. And so a second way I see this project extending previous work is by examining the extent to which early life contexts shape trajectories of health by both self-identified race and by skin color. And there's been prior work suggesting that the surrounding racial context could shape the meanings and the consequences of race and skin tone. So for example, the heterogeneous race model, which was originally developed by Aaron Silius and Daphne Oysterman in 2001, argues that skin tone will have different meanings and different significance in settings that are exclusively in-group, right? So in this case, in predominantly Black schools, than it will in interracial or predominantly out-group settings, right? So thinking about predominantly white schools. And it would make sense, right, that skin color has different meanings across spaces, given the history behind colorism and how it's been experienced among the Black population in terms of privilege or disadvantage. So one example is the case of dark brown skin, which has traditionally been considered a negative attribute by both white Americans and other black Americans. So we might expect darker skinned black Americans to receive worse treatment from both whites and other black Americans. However, while those of light skin may be treated more favorably by whites, they may also experience um, unfair treatment from other black Americans because they're less readily perceived as members of the black community and might be treated as, as such, right? Those of medium brown skin, however, might be less stigmatized in majority black contexts as these individuals represent this quote unquote prototypic black phenotype, right? So that's to say that medium black skin tones are not associated with the negative characteristics that have been assigned to their light or darker skin counterparts within the black community, right? And historically, there's never really been derogatory terms associated with medium brown skin inside uh, of the race, right? And so this might make interracial interactions easier and could afford medium skinned black Americans a type of protection when they're living or navigating predominantly, predominantly black spaces, right? But how these dynamics might translate into differences in health especially across the life course remains unclear. So bringing all this back together, uh, the, the two main research objectives that I'll show you results for today are one, um, to explore the extent to which race and skin color differentially influence uh, depressive symptoms between black and white young adults across the life course. And then to evaluate whether the health consequences of race and skin color depend on the racial context in early life and racial context defined here as the racial composition of schools. And so I use data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, better known as Ad Health, which is a nationally representative study of US adolescents who were in grades seven through 12 in 1994 and 1995. And there's been four additional waves of follow-up data between 1996 and 2018. And I'm drawing on all five waves of uh, the ad health data, which span ages 12 to 42. And my analytic sample is restricted to US born women and men who self-identify as white or African-American or black. And additionally, if the respondent identified as black, they also had to have uh, valid skin tone information. And if a respondent identified as uh, multiple races, as biracial, there's a question in Ad Health that asks uh, which racial category the respondent most strongly identifies with, 
And so we use that um, indicator to place respondents into a specific uh, racial category. So the focus here is on depressive symptoms. And so I used four items that were measured across all five waves, right? And these are part of a set of items that have been shown to be invariants across uh, race, ethnicity, and immigrant generation, right? So the, the, it makes these items pretty ideal uh, to contrast racial groups. And so respondents were asked how frequently they experienced each of these symptoms in the last seven days, ranging from um, never or rarely to most of the time, so on a scale of zero to three. And so the responses were reverse coded when necessary and summed across these four items at each wave. Again, the two dimensions of race were self-identified race, white and black, with white serving as the reference group, and then socially assigned skin tone was assessed as the interviewer's rating of the respondent's skin color. And so ad health interviewers were asked to rate the skin complexion of the respondent according to five categories um, in wave three. Um, and these categories were black, dark brown, medium brown, light brown, and white. And so given that there were very few black respondents who uh, interviewer, interviewers rated as having um, a white skin tone, uh, we combined these two lightest categories. And skin color was only considered among black respondents because there actually wasn't enough variation among white respondents in terms of, of skin tone. And so the resulting categories that we'll talk about today um, are very dark, dark, medium, and light. And then school composition, school racial composition was taken from wave one. And this is when respondents are about 12 to 20 years old. And we're examining both the proportion of black students at the school and the proportion of non-Hispanic white students. And then we control for a variety of individual family and school characteristics. We're also using growth curve models to examine these trends in health inequality across ages 12 to 42. And so these models are estimating person specific intercepts, right? These initial values at age 12, as well as the slopes or rates of change that describe intra-individual patterns of change in health as a function of age. And so our model fit indices suggested that a cubic growth trend with random intercepts and random linear slopes provided the best fit to the data. Um, and additional analyses suggested that interacting the covariates on the linear age slopes only provided the best fit compared to interacting the covariates with higher order age terms. And so interactions between linear age, the continuous measure of school racial composition and race or skin color were estimated and kind of the focus of uh, these analyses. So the results. Um, what I'm first gonna show you are the initial trajectories of depressive symptoms. So trajectories by race and skin color that only include the controls in the models and not taking into account the school context. And what we're seeing, right, consistent with prior research is that black respondents tend to report more initial depressive symptoms than whites, but follow similar uh, age patterns across adulthood. So we see pretty persistent gaps across the age range. When we further disaggregate black respondents by skin tone, we get a bit of a different story, right? So specifically, black respondents rating as, have, as having very dark brown skin, this red line, began with similar levels of depressive symptoms as whites, but experienced pretty slow rates of decrease uh, in symptoms across early adulthood, right? And so this group ends up having the highest levels of depressive symptoms by about the mid thirties. Uh, conversely, uh, black respondents rated as having light, medium or dark brown skin begin with initial, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, begin with higher initial levels of depressive symptoms but experience a faster rate of decline in symptoms during their 20s, right? Ultimately converging with the trajectory for white respondents in the late 30s and early 40s. And so these next trajectories we're gonna look at are for black and white respondents who go to schools with different proportions of black students. And so again, these trajectories are based on results that estimated a three-way interaction between race or skin color 
uh, school racial composition and age. And so to illustrate these findings, I'm showing trajectories for students in schools with low and high proportions of black students, right? And so this is defined, low proportions are defined as one standard deviation below the mean and high proportions are defined as one standard deviation above the mean. And what we're seeing here is that black respondents who attended schools with low proportions of black students, right? So this green line experience no decrease really um, in depressive symptoms across the first part of this age range. And they also end up with the highest uh, levels of depressive symptoms. Black respondents who attended schools with higher proportions of black students, this yellow line, experience a slower rate of increase, right, um, in depressive symptoms across the, I'm sorry, a slower rate of, uh, faster rate of decrease uh, across the teens and early 20s and had lower levels of symptoms by their early 30s, right, lower levels of symptoms compared to their black counterparts in low proportion black schools. White respondents who went to high proportion black schools had lower levels of initial symptoms, but experienced pretty steady increases in symptoms across adulthood. And white respondents who went to low proportion black schools, this blue line, uh, experienced the most favorable trajectories in depressive symptoms, right? And so these results, you know, the fewer symptoms for black respondents in predominantly black schools are consistent with what uh, Waltzman and colleagues found in 2011. So we're gonna look at these trajectories um, among those attending uh, high proportion black schools, again, with the black sample further disaggregated by skin color. And so what the results suggest is that for those attending um, schools with high proportions of black students, black respondents rated as having very dark skin tones. So the red line uh, experienced shallower decreases in symptoms across adolescence and early adulthood uh, compared to the other skin color groups. And so it's this group that experiences the most depressive symptoms by young adulthood and the beginning of mid midlife. Um, and, it's, and this is the same group that had similar trajectories to uh, their white counterparts who also attended high proportion black schools. Respondents rated as having very light skin. So this light blue line I hope is showing up um, have the highest initial levels of depressive symptoms. Uh, but follow similar age trends as their medium and dark skinned counterparts uh, who are depicted in these green and yellow lines. And so all skin color groups with the exception of those rated as having very dark brown skin uh, experience fewer depressive symptoms by about the early 30s compared to whites and compared to their very dark skin counterparts. We see a little bit of a different story when we're looking at respondents who went to schools uh, with low proportions of black students. Um, so again, as we saw a few slides ago, um, white respondents who attended these schools have the most advantaged trajectories. And respondents rated as having light brown skin start off with the highest levels of depressive symptoms, but experience relatively steeper decreases in symptoms across the 20s and 30s. And all other skin color uh, groups follow similar trajectories, right? Um, in which they begin uh, with similar levels of symptoms as whites, but experience more gradual increases in symptoms with age. Okay, so next I'm gonna show you the same set of plots, except um, these plots are showing results looking at high and low proportions of white students. So looking at racial differences, as we might expect, uh, black respondents who attended uh, predominantly white schools, this yellow line, experienced faster rates of increase in depressive symptoms than their white counterparts, right? Which resulted in higher levels of symptoms across the majority of adulthood. And we can compare this to their black counterparts who attended low proportion white schools, this green line, who experienced uh, lower levels of depressive symptoms. <clears throat> 
And then white respondents who attended predominantly white schools um, experienced the best symptom trajectories. And so similar to the proportion black uh, results, this slide is showing trajectories uh, among skin color groups uh, for students who went to uh, schools with high proportions of white students. And we're seeing um, a relatively disadvantaged trajectory among uh, respondents rated as having medium brown skin, right? As this is the group that's experiencing more steady increases in symptoms across adulthood. And then interestingly, uh, we see that respondents rated as having light or dark brown skin uh, report higher initial levels of symptoms relative to whites uh, and other skin color groups. And we're also seeing, interestingly, that those rated as having very dark brown skin, this red line, experience fewer depressive symptoms than their Black counterparts um, of different skin shades, right, and end up with um, somewhat favorable levels of depressive symptoms um, at the later ages. And then lastly, uh, these are trajectories among those who went to to schools with low proportions of white students. Um, and these trajectories are very similar to, to the ones that we saw for high proportion black schools, right? Um, in which those rated as having very dark brown skin experience more depressive symptoms with age. While those rated as having very light skin experience this initial disadvantage in depressive symptoms. And the trajectories for those writers having medium or dark brown skin falling somewhere in between um, those with light and very dark brown skin. So I just threw a lot of results at you, right? And so what do all of these um, results indicate? And so I think overall, right, the results are suggesting that compared to whites um, and compared to their black counterparts who attended schools with lower proportions of black students, right? Um, black respondents who attended predominantly black schools experienced fewer depressive symptoms across adulthood, right? Um, and there were more favorable trajectories experienced among those in these middle skin color categories, right? Because if we remember, um, black respondents having um, very light skin started off with higher depressive symptoms uh, whereas those who are rated as having very dark brown skin experienced uh, more depressive symptoms generally across adulthood, particularly in the later years. Conversely, right, Black respondents who attended predominantly white schools experienced more depressive symptoms across adulthood. But we also saw more variation in the patterns of advantage and disadvantage uh, among students who attended these types of schools. Uh, with Black respondents rated as having medium brown skin experiencing more depressive symptoms towards uh, the early 30s and later, while those rated as having light or dark brown skin um, experienced initial disadvantages that waned with age. So what might be going on here, right? And this is something that I'm still thinking through, but one possibility has to do with these inter and intra-group dynamics that might differentially work to shape health, All right? So if we go back to the heterogeneous race model, we know that social identities can be made more or less salient depending on the racial context. And so when individuals are surrounded by members of a similar social group, right? So like black respondents attending predominantly, predominantly black schools, they might draw on these alternative identities or categories to create uh, in-groups and out-groups, right? And use those groups to navigate their social spaces. And so the construction and the consequences of these groupings may create situations in which there are more negative interactions between groups who are you know, quite different from one another, which could lead to a unique set of risks and resources. So for example, those of very dark brown skin and very light brown skin may be treated more negatively in predominantly black schools, given the types of stereotypes that have been assigned to these categories, 
and there's support for this type of explanation, right? Um, as there have been studies showing that while uh, darker brown, uh, excuse me, darker skinned Black Americans report more discrimination from whites than their lighter skin counterparts, those of both dark and light brown skin report more discrimination from other members of the Black population, right, um, relative to their medium skin counterparts. And then another possibility, which might help to explain these initial disadvantages among white skin black respondents in particular, is that navigating these types of contexts in early life, right, uh, particularly uh, predominantly black spaces, might shape the types of behaviors or coping strategies that are developed um, and that are activated in the face of hardships across adulthood. So things like racial identity, um, sense of mastery, uh, sensitivity to discrimination. Right. So for example, um, messages of self-pride or self-esteem could be preached um, could be preached to or reinforced among darker skinned Black Americans, uh, given this knowledge of how colorism may come to affect them. Right? And so these early life experiences may lead to differences in how Black Americans of different skin shades would navigate life. Right? But in certain contexts, right, with the achievement of socioeconomic resources or the strains associated with achievement of socioeconomic uh, resources, uh, these consequences could wane over time or exacerbate over time. I just want to um, touch on a few plans uh, for future analyses to help uh, explore these relationships. Uh, the first, of course, is to examine um, what kinds of mechanisms could uh, could be linking uh, these school contexts to health and um, differentially linking these school contexts to health for various skin color groups. And so I've taken a look at a few um, sets of mechanisms. Um, so one, socioeconomic achievement in adulthood, um, psychosocial factors, things like stress, self-esteem, mastery and different um, school factors, right? So perceived discrimination from other students, um, perceived school connectedness. And they actually don't do much. Um, there is some evidence that some of these psychosocial factors help to explain um, the disadvantages of darker skin respondents in high proportion white schools. Um, but otherwise, uh, these particular uh, factors aren't explaining much of the gap. And so this also leads me to um, want to explore racial contexts that are experienced in adulthood. I also have plans to look at other health outcomes to see if the findings are similar, uh, primarily BMI and um, self-rated health. And then really wanting to get into this examination of the skin tone composition of schools. So seeing whether um, a darker skin black student who attends a primarily a, a school in which most of the students are lighter skin, right? What those kinds of dynamics might produce. And this is possible if we um, aggregate the uh, skin color measure uh, to the school level, right? So that's definitely on tap for um, the future. And then of course, examining any gender differences, particularly when it comes to depressive uh, symptoms, because we know mental health can be um, a gendered phenomenon, right? And so I just wanna leave you with some final thoughts. Um, so one, thinking about how the results from this uh, project suggest that multiple dimensions of race are consequential for health and well-being, right? And these types of findings, um, have implications for how we can or should measure race um, or assess race, racial inequality. Okay. And so the intersections of racism and colorism um, that might that were alluded to here uh, could produce lived experiences in which race and racial inequality don't mean the same thing for all minorities. And so similarly, right, thinking about um, why and how social inequality isn't experienced equally. Um, by all members of, in this case, the Black American population. And really thinking about um, the social advantages um, and disadvantages that uh, could differ across spaces, right? So thinking about um, how embodying multiple statuses or multiple identities can be accompanied by various degrees of uh, power or oppression in different types of contexts. And then lastly, um, you know, 
I think it will be important to think about how we might harness or distribute uh, unique types of protections that are experienced in predominantly black spaces, right? As well as mitigate um, some increased risks or, or uh, unique risks that um, exist both in predominantly black spaces as well as in predominantly white spaces. And so with that, I'll just um, acknowledge uh, Ad Health um, and the great data that they provide. And I look forward to your questions and comments. I guess I'll stop sharing screen. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Hargrove, for that fascinating talk. Uh, so per usual, we're gonna open up the floor for questions. Uh, the first questions will come from some of our graduate students. I'm trying to look through here to see where hands are raised. And my screen is very small. One second, please. So we have some messages in the chat now here. Um, so for you, Dr. Hargrove, three questions. Uh, feel free to, to pick one, one or all of them from, uh, from the message here. Uh, what are the factors that contribute to the higher initial levels of depression for the lighter skin groups? Second, what control variables did you include in this particular study? And lastly, what kind of analytic software were you using for this particular analysis? Maybe you mentioned a particular packages or approaches would be useful there. Yeah, so I'll start with the last two questions. Um, they're probably a bit simpler. Um, so I use SATA, SATA 16, um, and the uh, mixed commands within SATA to do these multi-level growth curves. Um, and uh, within, the, within that uh, command, you can do um, mixed effects, so both random and fixed effects models. Um, the control variables included things like um, gender, uh, marital status, um, uh, uh, parental education, uh, household income, and um, school level disadvantage, so socioeconomic disadvantage, um, school characteristics such as uh, the region of the school, the urbanicity, uh, the size of the school. Um, I believe that should be it for this, the school um, levels. And so, yeah, so thinking about the factors that contribute to these higher levels of depressive symptoms for lighter skin groups, right? And again, thinking about um, how in both contexts, right, um, that these uh, individuals uh, experience more depressive symptoms. And part of it has to do with uh, quite a few of the uh, respondents who are rated as having light skin also identify as two races, right? So they identify as biracial. And so uh, we know that individuals who identify as biracial and even just those who um, identify as black but have very light skin who are often either interpreted as um, being white or biracial this can add to strain, right? This can add to stress because um, they, they are not accepted by other white students, right? But they're also not accepted by other black students, right? So there's this kind of nebulous space that a lot of um, lighter skinned individuals occupy and experience uh, different types of discrimination from both white and um, black individuals. So. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions in the queue. I believe the first one in was Mark. Hey, Taylor. Great Hi. talk. Thank you. Um, I'm going to sound like a developmentalist here in a minute. My apologies to my human development colleagues. Um, so, you know, you have a window in which you're observing people. And, um, and you have elementary school, which is when kids are coming out of elementary school and they're in different schools with different racial compositions, then they transition into different kinds of schools as they move up the, the kind of food chain, if you will, into high school. So I'm, I'm curious about that because I think it may factor into kind of racial identity. And then post high school where you're looking at, um, there's, a, there's some evidence that a lot of adult identities don't get set. Mm 
-hmm. until in the 20s, right? So you, in some ways, you have maybe reflection, your results reflect that. But I'm just kind of curious about the ways in which both pre and post are feeding into racial identity and how that may factor into, because it's, I suspect, you know, there is some fluidity um, to that as people solidify who, you know, who they think they are and what their place is in the world. So your yeah. thoughts. Yeah, no, great question. Um, racial identity absolutely is something uh, fluid, right? Um, and something that even changes among adults, right? depending on um, the context, the types of context that they're navigating. And so thinking about elementary school, which, you know, we, we can't capture in ad health, but um, I believe if we think about socialization factors, right, especially for um, uh, Black young uh, children navigating the U.S., as well as uh, darker skinned, right, Black um, individuals, the messages could be different. Right, and um, particularly uh, they could be different and they could be coming earlier if um, young people are exposed to um, more negative comments in, um, in uh, elementary school, right? So um, thinking anecdotally, which I know is not always appropriate in um, <laughs> academic talks, um, but my, my goddaughter who um, is very light skinned um, who has already received, she's only in first grade, she's already received comments about her being different and how she's gray. Right, and how she can't um, go down uh, someone's slide because she's gray, right? And so her parents having to, or forced, right, to talk about um, what is going on and why he might have said that. So thinking about how these socialization messages differ both in timing and in content, I think is really important to think about, um, as well as. Um, you know, going through the, the um, schools that we do have information on, middle school, high school, and just that accumulation of different experiences that could tailor um, at any given moment, right, one's racial identity that could either help solidify um, a positive outlook towards one's racial identity, identity, or could work to create these internalized biases, right, um, depending on the messages that people are getting in schools, but also in the other types of uh, institutions that they're navigating, right? So from the family, from workplaces, it would be great um, to look at how the racial composition of colleges might also be playing a role here. But unfortunately, we could we only have information on college graduates, <laughs> which would cut down the sample size just a bit. But I think that's something really important to think about, just the types of influences on racial identity and in particular, um, protective forms of racial identity. Hope that wasn't too much rambling. <laughs> that was my, my apologies to the uh, developmentalist so for <laughs> asking that question. Thank uh, you. I think up next we have a question from Dr. Benner. All right, hi, thank you so much for your talk. I also am very interested in kind of school composition factors and what that means for adolescents. And although a developmentalist, I'm gonna ask more of a structural question because Mark and I are just gonna switch things off. <laughs> I am very interested in what your thoughts are on how these findings might look different if we're not looking just at that black white dynamic, but thinking about kind of the school composition more broadly. So mm -hmm. what about adolescents who are in schools with more Latino or Latinas or other kinds of compositions and what, how you think these results might look similar or different? Absolutely, thank you um, for that question. I think they would look similar. Uh, no, well, let me back up. So we know that uh, the majority of ad health respondents are going to predominantly black schools. But what we don't know is whether um, that other uh, racial group is white or whether it is like you said, Latinos, Asians, uh, or, or what have you. And so I think that given just the pervasive ideologies around uh, racism and colorism, right, will kind of permeate uh, through any of those contexts. So I would expect to see um, probably similar findings, but perhaps less uh, of an inequality, right? I, I still think there would be different types of messages and treatments going on based on uh, both skin color and race, but perhaps not to, to the degree that we're seeing in um, 
uh, predominantly white schools versus uh, predominantly black schools. But I think that would be something interesting to explore. And I, I would have to double check what's available um, in ad health in terms of uh, thinking about, you know, the, who's going to these types of schools that are very multiracial, right? Um, and kind of what that means, again, for uh, racial identity development, but also um, our understandings of race relations, right? I think we don't know a lot about uh, race relations, particularly in adolescence uh, between uh, black individuals and non-whites, right? So race relations between black and Hispanic or Latino and Asian students. So it's, I think I would expect the gaps to be a little smaller, but certainly um, an empirical question that I would love if someone were to, to look at. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have a question from Dr. Varner. Hi, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, so, so many questions came to mind and definitely um, Mark um, touched on one of the one, ones I had because I was really interested in, because you do have seventh through 12th graders. And so mm -hmm. I was thinking about the shift from middle school to high school. Um, and this might be a small population, but I know that some parents are really struggling with the decisions about where, they're, where their black children should go because sometimes there are these academic um, opportunities that are in predominantly white schools, but they've been in a predominantly black school earlier. And so I don't know if that's something possible to examine. It might be a very small population, but having that shift in composition possibly from middle school to high school, if that affects trajectories. Yeah, so seeing, um, so seeing if attending a predominantly white middle school, but a predominantly black high school could affect some of these trajectories. Right, or, or the opposite, or the reverse. Or the, or the reverse. Yeah, so um, great. Yeah, I think that would be a great question that is not possible with ad health because I only I believe only have school uh, data for uh, the school that they were in attendance during wave one. But I think we could, you know, I, I could see different situations, right? So if you're going from a predominantly black middle school where there could have been some kinds of protections, right? Uh, because everyone looked like you, you're likely going to school in, um, uh, in which you're going to school with neighbors, right? So you have this kind of continuity of um, individuals that you're around and kind of less um, exposure to at least racial discrimination, right? But then when you're headed to a predominantly white um, high school, parents potentially uh, preparing their students for um, any kind of negative experiences, not only from other students, but from the administration, right? And thinking about, um, again, that timing of socialization. Whereas if it were the reverse, where you have students going to predominantly black, excuse me, predominantly white um, elementary schools where parents might have had to already have done that uh, socialization work um, and then perhaps continue uh, that socialization work in predominantly uh, black schools, right? That could, I think, look a bit different for the types of, um, uh, personal resources or protective resources that are developed. But I think something really interesting to um, explore for sure. And I just have one other, sorry, sorry. Um, were there differences in social class as adults for the people who are in these different um, predominantly black or white schools? And was that accounted for in those analyses? Yeah, so I did look at whether um, adult socioeconomic characteristics, so um, educational attainment, income, and uh, marital status by way five, whether those were explaining some of these relationships, and they didn't. But what I didn't look at was um, kind of uh, um, an interaction, right, to see if these trajectories qualitatively were different um, for those who ended up with higher levels of socioeconomic resources, resources versus lower levels. Thank you. All right, so we are, we are down to nine minutes. So I don't think we're gonna get to everyone, but next up is a question from Dr. Conwell. Hi Taylor, thanks. Um, great talk, really interesting and important stuff. 
Um, I want to first second some of the comments from Mark and then Chantal in the chat about um, potential, you know, the timing of this, of school as a treatment, potential changes across age in school context, both in K-12 and then, of course, for college. And we could think about the possibility that there's intentional selection. We know anecdotally that some students who went to predominantly white schools intentionally choose predominantly non-white colleges and those kind of things. Um, you know, I think I, at the risk of losing my sociologist of education card, I want to actually ask a question about the difficulty of identifying this as a school effect. Mm -hmm. um, and just how do you think about school as one institution that influences identity along with the whole ecosystem of other identity influencing institutions that kids are exposed to? I mean, we know anecdotally from work on the black middle class that Black families who have their kids in predominantly white schools intentionally spend a lot of time in predominantly Black churches and other spaces. And so I, love, I don't know if this is something we can measure, but I'd love to hear you talk about kind of how you're thinking about identifying this as a, an educational phenomenon. Yeah, no, great question, right? And I, I think it would be naive of me to say that this is just coming from the school context, right? Uh, because we know, uh, particularly in the US, given this uh, level of segregation, a residential segregation that exists, right? There's so much overlap between the school context, the neighborhood context. And then of course you can't uh, discount the importance of, of the family, right? Um, and their uh, previous experiences and their you know, current experiences or their current, current resources. So I think they're all playing a role. And I think a way to potentially um, look at that would be to also consider um, the, the racial composition of the neighborhood in um, these analyses, right? So to control for that and seeing it and you know, assessing whether we're still seeing these types of um, relationships above and beyond um, the neighborhood racial composition, which would also um, kind of get at um, not only family, but uh, socialization processes that occur among neighbors or close friends, right? And so I think that would, could be one interesting way to uh, try to account for that. Um, it, I think it gets harder to, uh, at least empirically, <laughs> look at uh, the family context and seeing um, how that's playing a role. But I think it's important to think about how schools can either solidify messages that are coming from the students, right? So solidifying um, messages around um, being proud of who you are, right? Or um, messages that everyone is created equal or should be treated equally uh, versus these conflicting messages of, well, I should be proud of who I am and what I look like, but I'm treated uh, very differently. And so I think it all still involves that school context, but even though it's certainly um, influenced by these other systems institutions that could either be um, cons being consistent with what the school context is producing or drastically different. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go, looking at school neighborhoods interaction. And then, you know, I, as you noted with segregation, there's not a lot of mismatches, right? If your school's predominantly yeah, yeah. black, your neighbor, but like just trying to kind of probe that a little bit. Um, and anyway, we can talk more. I don't want to take up all the time, but this was great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And with five minutes to go, a question from Dr. Schultz. Hi, Taylor. Um, hey. So I wanted to ask you about um, why you don't look at the more integrated schools. Maybe there's not many in the data, you know. Um, and the reason I ask is because of Carolyn Tyson's work, you know, which I'm sure you're. I'm mm -hmm. familiar with, yeah. is that she finds that there's more tracking, right, in the schools that have, uh, are more integrated, 30 to 60 percent, and so, like, the politics of race in the schools, right, are more, like, unsettled, right, um, and um, there's a lot of research that kind of looks at how, like, unsettled identities um, shape behavior and outcomes, right, so, so that's, that's my first question. My second question, I'm a works uh, researcher. So I'm interested in like the work context over the life course, right? And I think you could maybe get some measures using occupation and industry of racial compositions in states, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, from the CPS or something. And I'm just curious to the degree to which those explain anything or or they don't or, you know, another, another direct possible direction. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you um, for those comments. Um, so I think you you did mention that there's few integrated schools um, in ad health and in particular white respondents 
do not go to integrated schools. <laughs> the majority of white respondents go to schools that are, I believe, are at least 80% white. Um, and so what we would be looking at um, are more so uh, skin color differences uh, amongst Black Americans and not really seeing how they fare um, to the white respondents. But still, I think similar to, I believe Dr. Benner asked, um, something to explore in terms of who's in those schools, right? Um, who are in these integrated schools and what is the, co the racial composition of those integrated schools? Is it, you know, half Black and then a third Asian and Latino, which I think are very far and few between. Um, but there could be, especially thinking about unique sets of resources that could be developed in those kinds of contexts is certainly worthy of further um, exploration. And so definitely um, something I'll be thinking about and, and seeing at least uh, empirically if it's uh, if I'm able to um, look at some of those trends within those types of schools. But again, um, very few in ad health. And then your question about um, the work context, absolutely. Um, and so Lauren and I, Lauren Gaydosh and I, who I believe is still on this call, um, have worked, <laughs> have um, worked on integrating a bunch of contextual data from um, across waves one to five at, at health um, and, and continue to work on integrating contextual data, um, including, you know, thinking about, like you said, the, the risk composition of the occupation that is uh, prevalent within states and even just the, the racial compositions of counties and, and states themselves or tracks. And I think including that information uh, within these types of analyses could be beneficial. You know, getting back to Jordan's comment about um, these other ecosystems um, or social institutions that are playing a role at the same time. And so, like you were saying, to, to try to parse out um, some of those influences would be very helpful. OK. We're going to live really dangerously. We have about a minute and a half. Dr. Anderson, if you want to try your question? Uh, again, we do cut one. If anybody would like to stay for the answer, please do. Dr. Anderson, go ahead. OK, thanks so much. And Taylor, this is absolutely fascinating. I love looking at the different trajectories and thinking about them and the different um, theories and counter theories is wonderful. So I was just curious about um, if I'm remembering it correctly. Um, the, the relatively higher depressive symptoms among um, whites and high proportion black schools, is that correct? Mm, that's correct. Yeah. Um, do you view that as a theoretically informative case or something that might crack open some of these theories? Yeah, so um, one, it, I don't think it's a problem. Well, what, let me back up. Um, one, those are very few of the respondents, right? There are very few respondents who go to schools um, with high proportions of Black students. So that's a very special case. Um, and I, my sense is that a lot of what's happening there is that these are students from socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods. And so I, I would think that um, that is playing a role in some of the trajectories we see. But also I think it, it goes in line with thinking about the heterogeneous race model and how um, one's racial status can be interpreted differently in um, uh, different contexts. So uh, these schools are one of the only places that these particular individuals are seen as the minority, right? Or, or could be seen as the out group and could be treated as such. And so I think it makes sense theoretically um, given that prior work, but then once they go out into the workforce, um, or attain higher levels of education, right? Then their identity is seen as um, more within, you know, the in group. But I think it could be something very uh, particular happening in the, especially in early life, right? And how their identity is formed, right? And how it's it's interpreted. Thanks so much. Thank you. Wonderful. We managed to do it. It's one o'clock. So yeah. everyone. <laughs> This, this is the conclusion of today's uh, seminar that's co-sponsored by the Center on Aging and Population Sciences. If you please join me in thanking Dr. Hargrove again for a wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for the feedback. <laughs>